This morning I'll read John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. May the Lord add the blessing to his reading of his word. You may be seated. So this morning's uh, message, we're going to be talking about the greatest gift. And, uh, and I don't know, uh, typically when we think of the Christmas story, we think of the story in Luke chapter 1, chapter 2. And, uh, and that really is, you know, we, um, our custom uh, at our home is that we read uh, uh, Luke chapter 2 before we do any gifts or anything like that. And, uh, uh, and that really is the, the, the Christmas story that, uh, that we all know. And we add in Matthew chapter 1 and uh, sometimes Matthew chapter 2, the gifts of the wise men and, uh, and, and all of that. But did you know that uh, um, Mark, the other gospel, um, doesn't include uh, a Christmas story, and uh, but John does, and uh, and many of us miss the fact that John includes a Christmas story. It's just really, really short, right? And so it's summed up in verse uh, chapter or chapter one, verse fourteen, that mess or that uh, scripture that I read for you this morning, and the word became flesh, right? That's the Christmas story, the fact that Jesus became flesh. Now, we have to uh, back up just a little bit because it doesn't actually mention Jesus there. Um, it says the word became flesh, and, uh, and I, I hope to uh, convince you in, in just a moment that, um, that we're talking about Jesus here. This is the most concise statement of the incarnation in the Bible. You know, just uh, uh, five words, and the word became flesh. And if you include the whole verse, and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, the glory is of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And it truly captures so much. Um, the stories that are in Luke chapter 2 and uh, Matthew chapter 1, those were events things that kind of happened. John takes a different tact when he declares the Christmas story. His is all theological, spiritual, if you will. And, uh, and in this one verse, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to do uh, 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 any great service to this verse. Um, this one verse probably could spur... Um, countless um, messages, uh, but we only have a ch we have, I have time to uh, to look at it uh, uh, in a cursory glance and uh, and make our way through there. Um, and Matthew and Luke include um, the attention to details. You know the the fact that uh, that Mary was a virgin, the the fact that um, that they were um, that they had to travel to Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph had to travel to Bethlehem, you know, and uh, they got to uh, Bethlehem. There was no place to, to put the baby, and, uh, and so they ended up giving birth to the baby Jesus in a cattle stall somewhere. Um, you know, those kinds of details. John doesn't include any of those. Um, I talked about the fact that, uh, you know, this says that the word became flesh. Now, uh, in order to understand this, you have to back up just a little bit. In the, um, in the beginning of John's gospel, um, it talks about um, this word that we're talking about. And it begins with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Right, so that's the backdrop to John using this idea that the word became flesh. Excuse me. And we're talking about God himself and God manifesting himself um, to us on this earth 
and, uh, and the, the fact that Jesus Christ was that manifestation. Um, and if you read all through there and you make heads and tails of uh, uh, what those couple of scriptures tell us about this word, we find out that the word was always existent. It existed um, along with God from eternity. And, uh, and at the moment that creation began, that, that moment in time, or at, well, I can't even say that moment in time, that moment in eternity, because uh, at that moment of creation, God created time. There, there is no time outside of what God created, right? We, we can't quite understand how that, how that works. We, we can only think in terms of time. We can only think in, in terms of years or, or days or moments. Or, um, but uh, to God, time is irrelevant. Um, and, uh, and so um, in the beginning, when, when God decided to, to speak and utter the words that, that brought forth all of creation, Jesus had existed at that point, had always existed. And it goes on to tell us that, that, that Jesus was, in fact, God. Now that becomes important in our scripture. Um, the fact that the word became flesh. God came to this earth. Um, God himself decided to come and become a man. Now why? Why would God do that? You know? Now we, we all know and, and Caleb uh, certainly understands the story or, or knew the, 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 the reason why Jesus came. Did we have, did Jesus had to come in order to come. He had to come as a man to, to die on the cross for our sins and, and all of that. Um, but this was God, right? This was God, the one who made the rules. And so God could have said, well... You know, instead of going through all that, I'll just forgive the people and, you know, we'll just wipe their slate clean and, and we'll start over. Um, he could have wiped out humanity um, from their sin and, and started over and said, uh, you know, I'll try this again and uh, maybe I'll get some perfect people, right? Um, that was not in God's plan. All from all along, from the, that, that moment in eternity before time even began, God knew that Jesus would have to be uh, sent to this earth um, to, to rescue those people. And so the word became flesh, and uh, we move on then to the next part of that, and dwelt among us. This is a... This is a fascinating, a fascinating statement. The, the, uh, the words actually used there in the, uh, the Greek says that, um, that the word tabernacled with us. Um, actually, in the, 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 the literal translation of that means that he pitched a tent next door. So our neighbor next door pitched a tent and decided to, to come and stay. That's kind of an amazing um, thought, if you will. Um, God didn't put himself, um, you know, even the fact that uh, if we could wrap our minds around why God decided to come to this earth, he didn't put himself in a palace somewhere um, with, you know, moats and gates and, you know, all that kind of thing and, and guards and uh, uh, keep himself away from society. He pitched a tent right next door. In your backyard, if you will, or maybe your side yard. He pitched a tent. The idea here is that he tabernacled. And, uh, you know, and so the word actually is tabernacled with us. And, uh, and uh, to get the full meaning, the full understanding of what this means, when you hear the word tabernacle, that should take us back to when God established the tabernacle with the Israelite people. Back in Exodus chapter 30, um, when, uh, when God was giving the instructions to, uh, to Moses up on Mount Sinai, uh, he gave, them, gave him the Ten Commandments, and then after that gave him instructions for, 
for building the tabernacle, this place where God, this tent, if you will, where God would dwell among his people. You know, God had this uh, idea, and, uh, and his plan was that he was going to uh, choose his people. He would call them out. He called the Israelite people out, and he would live among them. And he, he, he instructed Moses and the people to, to build this place, this, this actual uh, uh, tent uh, where he would be established. Um, it wouldn't be till years later, uh, hundreds of years later, when there was actually a, a, a solid building built um, called the temple, and, uh, and David, King David, was the one that wanted to build that. We have the, the account of that in uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 7, where, where Daniel had this, or David, not Daniel, I said Daniel, but David had this idea that he was going to build a permanent place for God to dwell, a temple, and uh, and God came down and uh, through the prophet said, you know, you're not the one to build this place, and uh, uh, and, and you know, and I never asked for you to to build me a temple somewhere, uh, because God wanted to dwell with us right wherever we go god wanted to go with us he didn't want to be delegated or uh, put into a place and and forgotten about he wanted to go with us wherever we went but he relented and allowed solomon david's son to build that temple that temple was originally or eventually destroyed um, several times and rebuilt and uh uh, and at the moment, it is destroyed and, uh, and not rebuilt. Um, portions of it have been, uh, uh, for historical purposes, uh, uh, rebuilt and uh, that, that kind of thing. But uh, actually, the, uh, the, the, the site where the temple um, was located is now uh, a Muslim shrine. And uh, uh, something totally irrelevant to, uh, to the gospel message. But that was the, the, that place, that, that idea of an actual physical building somewhere was never God's plan. And, uh, um, and so um, this idea of a temple, the, a tent that could be picked up, this idea that he would go with us wherever we went is, uh, is interesting. And this idea of that temple or that uh, tabernacle, that uh, that. Uh, God instructed Moses and the people to build um, is actually a type of Jesus Christ himself. Um, that's a foreshadowing, if you will, in the Old Testament of Jesus as he would come. Um, it's so interesting as I was studying this, um, the, the, the number of allusions um, to uh, the things that are part of that original tabernacle that point to Jesus Christ. We don't have time to look at all of them, but the actual temple, it's, or the tabernacle itself, uh, apologize if I say temple, but for some reason that's coming out in my speech here, but the, um, the tabernacle itself was not something to look at. I mean, it wasn't very pretty. Um, actually, the, uh, the, the, outer, um, the outer wall of the uh, tabernacle was made out of porpoise skins. Um, and so it was gray and uh, kind of drab colored and, uh, and you know, that, that's all it was. It wasn't ornate. It wasn't, uh, um, it, and, you know, they, uh, as the, the Israelite people would wander and make their way through the wilderness, you know, they would roll these, uh, these curtains or these, uh, these walls up in, in panels and they would carry them and just unroll them and, and hang them there. And uh, so they, you just had this gray wall that surrounded. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and so the actual inner place of the tabernacle wasn't something that the ordinary normal people like you and I would ever see. But on the inside... Once you would get into the inner place, the, the Holy of Holies, that was the most ornate place. And a priest would only go there one time a year on the Day of Atonement. 
uh, to actually see the, the, the beauty of the temple. You know, the golden uh, 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 lampstand, the, uh, um, the, the Ark of the Covenant that was covered in gold, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the angels that were in there, that, uh, that all part of that, the, um, the mercy seat that on top of the cover, um, all that was never seen by the ordinary people. And people didn't actually go into the temple, you know, to see the inner workings and how that went. Only the Levites, as they would go in there in service. But there was beauty inside. Um, it kind of reminds me, I shared in, uh, in our message on Friday evening, um, that uh, uh, the message from Isaiah chapter, um, chapter 53 that, uh, that talks about Jesus, that he wasn't something to look at. Right? He wasn't something that we desired to see. And yet Christ was the gift, the greatest gift that could actually be given. So I talked about the idea that there was this judgment seat in there. there um, the idea that Jesus Christ, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but Jesus would come. Uh, that is actually his, his purpose as he would come to be the king. A king would bring judgment on the people that weren't part of his people, right? Um, you know, and uh, if a king would come and uh, uh, he would conquer the enemy, right? And so uh, he would bring judgment. Now, if you were part of the king's kingdom, right, you would belong, and so, you know, you would rejoice at that idea. Um, the Holy of Holies was in that uh, tabernacle, and uh, was actually the, uh, the, the, the inner working part. That was the, the place where God dwelt. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, as we said, the, 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 the high priest would only be able to go in there one time a year. Now, when, the, uh, the, when all this was imagined and was in the, the forming, it was because Moses was the, the spokesperson for God to the people. Moses was the one that went up on the mountain. Uh, the cloud would descend and the glory of God would, would be there and he would speak face to face with Moses and, uh, <coughs> and all of that. And then Moses would come down off the mountain and, uh, and bring the message and the word back to the people and, uh, and tell them what God is instructing them to do. Eventually, the tabernacle would be built, and, uh, uh, and it would be serviced by priests. These priests would go in, and they would actually do the work on the inside. If there were sacrifices that needed to be made, and, uh, uh, you know, and all the things that would go on inside, that was all taken care of by the priests. We talked about, in, as we were uh, studying the book of 1 Peter, this idea that we now are that kingdom of priests in this kingdom. God has called us to serve him. And we now are that tabernacle, the, that place where God dwells uh, here in this world. Right? In, uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, Paul says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? We are that temple. The next phrase of, uh, of our, our scripture this morning, and we have seen his glory. Now, to get the picture of what John was uh, talking about here, we have to go all the way back, uh, back to uh, the first couple pages in our Bibles, back to Genesis, when God was in the garden with Adam and Eve. God would appear to Adam and Eve and walk with them in the garden. He would allow his glory to come down and he would actually walk with them uh, day by day. And we find out then in chapter 3, uh, Genesis chapter 3, that after Adam and Eve sinned and they ate that apple that they hid from God. And when God came down to meet with the people, they hid because of their sin. They knew that they, they didn't stand a chance. Uh, of standing in the presence of God. Our sin keeps us from God. 
In Exodus chapter 33, we'll move back to, uh, the, to the tabernacle, and, uh, and uh, I'll talk about this story in a little bit, in a little more detail. But um, we are told that God was speaking to Moses and said that we cannot look on the face of God and live. He says in Exodus 33, 20, but he said, you cannot see my face, for a man shall not see me and live. Moses would meet with God and his face shone from being in God's presence and the, the people complained. You remember that story that when uh, Moses would come down from meeting with God um, after being in uh, the presence of God's glory, uh, his, his being shone. It said that his face was, uh, would glow, right? And, and the people complained and, and made him wear a veil. After he came down so that he could speak to the people. The people didn't want to be, can you imagine? The people didn't want to see um, that, that glory or the, 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 the uh, evidence of that glory that Moses was in. But now we have seen his glory. Jesus is the manifestation of God in human form. You know, he came and, uh, and uh, he came and ate with people. He allowed people to touch him. He touched people. Um, we actually had physical contact with God himself. Can you imagine what that would have been like? In Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36, we have the, um, the story of Peter, James, and John going with Jesus up on the mountain. And uh, we call this the transfiguration. And uh, Jesus went up there to pray. And, uh, uh, and uh, God allowed his glory to descend, or Jesus' glory to descend back on him, right? And uh, this cloud kind of enveloped them. And uh, uh, the disciples woke up, right, and saw this glory. And uh, Peter exclaimed, this is good, right? I, I don't... I don't know why the people in uh, the Israelite people back in Exodus, um, when they would see the glory on Moses' face, would de decide that it was not a good thing and they wanted to cover it up. But Peter said, this is good. We need to make some dwellings and just stay here, right? We don't need to go back to uh, living in the rest of the world. This, just, this, is, this is awesome, right? You know, we'll make a place for, uh, for Jesus. We'll make a place for Moses and, and Elijah, and we'll just... Right? We'll, we'll just stay here. Uh, those places, by, by the way, those, those places that Peter was uh, um, giving Jesus uh, the option to build were tabernacles, right? Those, these little tabernacles, these little um, huts, if you will, um, where they could stay. So we've seen his glory, but we are no longer are we separated from God because of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, we now have this full access to God. No longer is, is the inside of the tabernacle closed off from the people. And uh, we, we get the signification of this by um, going forward a little bit to when Jesus was crucified on the cross... Right, we we find out that the veil, the what separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temple or the the tabernacle, uh, if you will, uh, was rent from top to bottom. It was tore so that we now have access. We could go into that place where Jesus was, and that was brought on by the the crucifixion of Jesus and his dealing with our sin. Uh, getting ahead of myself. Move on to the next phrase in this, uh, uh, in this passage, and it says, And the glory as of the only Son from the Father. Now, John included this because there at the time was this idea that God could not become a man, right? Humanity and, uh, and anything physical was evil, and, uh, and, and God could not have anything to do with evil. This is the beginning of the Gnostic thought. And so John is saying that Jesus, this human that was born, this little baby that became flesh, really, really was God. And the glory displayed can only be from God himself. This is not some parlor trick or some cheap imitation. 
right? It's not some knockoff that we go to Walmart and buy and, uh, and it, you know, it, it fills the bill till the real thing comes. Jesus really was God. The belief that God could not become human was a, a Gnostic belief and eventually would become um, a problem in the early church um, in around the year 350, uh, just using ballpark numbers. I know that's not the actual number. Um, there was a, a sect of, um, I don't want to say Christians, but followers or whatever that grew up to become, and they were called the Aryan, uh, Aryans or the Arianism, and uh, because Arian was the uh, the chief, uh, he was the the, the guy that uh, that brought forth this idea, and I found this interesting, and I'll include this little bit of tidbit of uh, trivia for you. Um, the uh, the dealing with Arian uh, happened with. Um, a guy named St. Nicholas, yep, that's St. Nick that we talk about that Christmas is all about. And so we're talking about Christmas story. I figured I'd include this, this little story. But, um, and so the, 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 what happened was that uh, in, the, in and around the, uh, the late 200s, uh, in the early 300s, um, it was against the law. And actually, you were um, put to death if you were found to be a Christian, if you were a believer. Um, and there were so many believers at the time, and many of them, uh, that they, they just ended up putting in prison and, uh, and locked at the cell doors and, uh, and forgot about the people. They were uh, tortured, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, under the, uh, the emperor Diocletian, um, it became hideous uh, that... Uh, they would actually go out and seek people that, that they thought were Christians and they would torture them, cut off limbs, they would do things to them, you know, uh, hideous and evil things to them, trying to get them to, um, uh, to go against their beliefs, to, to confess that they, um, to give up Christianity, their, their, their ideas. And so there were all these these people, the, and typically by now, it were the, they were the monks that ended up living out, and uh, um, they were put into prisons, and many of them were, were maimed and crippled by, because of the torture, and um, they, they lost eyes, and uh, tongues were cut out, and uh, limbs were, were cut off, or they were uh, maimed by breaking of their, their bones, and uh, uh, they were cripples and, and all that. Along came an emperor, um, Constantine, uh, right after Diocletian, and, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, Constantine had this idea that he was going to use these people, the Christians, and, uh, and unite them, and, uh, and by doing that, he actually would conquer uh, the known world at that time. And he, in, under Constantine, the uh, uh, Christianity no longer was a, a pariah, no longer was it uh, uh, um, against the law, and no longer were you persecuted, but it actually became the, the belief of the people, and, uh, and it became a, a, a good thing to be a Christian. So now all of a sudden Christianity was popular, and, uh, and everybody wanted to be a Christian, and so all the people that were put into prison and all that were uh, because of their, their faith in Jesus Christ, they were set free. Nicholas was one of those people. He was a monk, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, he, he served in North Africa in, in a, a village there, and uh, he was the bishop of that particular place. And, uh, and so uh, Nicholas um, was one of those, those people that were called to... Uh, uh, the council that, that Constantine, Constantine called to, uh, to he called the, this council to uh, confront the idea of this Arianism uh, that was the, the, the major thing but they, he wanted to unite the, the church and to, uh, uh, to bring uh, unity I suppose uh, is 
um, so that everybody believed the same kind of thing. And uh, uh, but really became that that Nicene Council became the uh, um, the uh, the place where Arianism was finally dealt a death blow, if you will, or was confronted. And uh, and so uh, it was told. The story is told that uh, at this council, Arian, Arius was called to come and make a speech. And as he was declaring this idea that Jesus Christ could not have been a human, uh, Nicholas could not stand uh, to hear this. And so Nicholas, um, he was uh, crippled in one leg and uh, um, his face was disfigured because of the torture and, uh, and all of that. He came forward and... Uh, uh, and the, and the thing is that, uh, you know, according to some accounts, he actually punched Arius in the nose or slapped his face uh, because of the blasphemous um, words that Arius was speaking. That's the St. Nicholas that uh, Christmas is uh, uh, founded on. Nic Nicholas would go back and, uh, and do good things uh, for the people. He would uh, seek to, uh, to uh, take the money not take it, but uh, uh, get money from the rich people and 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 give it to the poor and, uh, and give gifts and and all that, um, and so that's where the Saint Nicholas tradition comes about. I to, just thought that was kind of interesting. Moving on, and uh, uh, to the last phrase in our uh, statement here or our text, it says that the Word or Jesus was full of grace and truth. This is the best part about Christmas. This is the greatest gift, if you will, um, this portion. And again, we're taken back to Exodus in Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. We have this story of Moses. Um, this is after the, uh, the, the golden calf incident, right? And uh, the, the people, while Moses were up on the mountain, um, instructed or uh, uh, cajoled Aaron to, uh, to make this calf out of their earrings and their rings and uh, their gold pieces and, and all of that. And so when Moses came down off the mountain and saw them worshiping um, this calf and, uh, you know, and all of that, and so the big blow up, you know, and so they had to deal with all of that. And, uh, and God calls back to Moses and said, you know, I can't, I can't go among the people anymore. Um, this idea of me living amongst the people is, um, is, is, is not going to work. Um, the people are too sinful and I cannot dwell there, but I still want you to lead them out of this place and, uh, and I will go with you. And uh, Moses makes a plea, says, you know, look, you know, if you don't lead us, um, you know, that's not going to look good. And anyway, you keep telling me you want me to lead, and uh, uh, you know how am I going to do this? And you know the the dialogue goes on, and Moses says to God, um, you know, if you want me to lead and <coughs> to do all this, um, show me your glory. Let me see you face to face. Come down here, that uh, you know. And, and, and God, you know, we had this story here in Exodus chapter 33 um, where God says, look, I can't, I can't allow you to see me face to face, but, you know, I will come down and, uh, and I will hide you in the cleft of a rock and, and I'll allow my goodness to pass before you. It says in 19 and 20, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim before you my name. The Lord and I will be gracious to you, uh, to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man cannot see my face and live. Because of our sin, we can't stand before God, but God allowed his goodness to pass before Moses. So where's all this going, right? You're thinking... Uh, in Exodus chapter 34, then, we continue on in this story. The Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there, talking about Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. 
This idea of being full of grace and truth is a, 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 a dichotomy, you know, at best, right? You have truth on one side and you have grace on the other. So you have the law on one side and then you have forgiveness. Uh, you know, I, how does that go together, right? Either you are, um, you are, you know, you follow the law or you forgive people when they, for, when, you know, God is full of grace and full of truth, and that was displayed in Jesus Christ. So how does that work? Where it says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. Jesus is the coming king, and he will bring judgment. Right? That's the idea when, he, when the second coming, he will come as king. When he came the first time as a baby, he came with peace. But there is coming a second time when he will come as king and that judgment will come. In Romans chapter 2, 4. Girls, what is that verse? Oh. It says, Or do you presume on the riches of his goodness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? That was one of our memory verses for Romans, by the way. Um, and we hear in 2 Peter chapter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The blood of Jesus is given because of this great love that allows us to confidently enter into his presence. Even though we are full of sin, because we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have confidence to enter in to the Holy of Holies and stand before God with confidence knowing that we will not be uh, struck dead. Right? In Hebrews 9, 11, and 14, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, I found that kind of interesting, those words, not made with hands, that is, not of his creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, but not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The words of uh, um, our message on Friday night, have you seen my Jesus, right? Jesus is the greatest gift, incomparable to any man-given gift. Because of the birth of a baby in a cattle stall over 2,000 years ago, we can have peace with God. Luke 2 10 and 11, the angels appeared to the angels, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, and he is Christ the Lord. We now have peace with God. We no longer have to fear standing in his presence. We no longer have to hide like Adam and Eve because of our sin. Our sin has been covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the giver of every good and perfect gift, that gift of Jesus, your one and only Son, given as our propitiation, that which makes peace with you on our behalf, we are eternally thankful. There is no greater gift given to men. Take us from here in a renewed confidence to come before you and to serve you with our whole beings. Use us to bring honor and glory to your name. Amen.